Okay, I'll get moving in a minute here. I'll wait for people to <clears throat> keep trickling in. Um, if anyone has any sort of small questions right now, especially logistics stuff, uh, and go ahead and ask. Not sure if this is a small question or not, but I'm wondering whether you can show us when how to um, use ggplot to plot two lines in the same chart. Mm -hmm. uh, it kind of depends on um, sort of uh, the type of uh, lines exactly you want to plot. So um, are you using the Gapminder data? Yes. So I was trying to do two lines of, say, for example, the Cambodia population rate uh, over the years versus like the average Asia population um, change over the years, but I was having okay. a hard time doing that. Yeah, okay, so there's a couple different ways you could do that. So if you want to, um, so let me see if I've got an idea for what the kind of thing you want. So um, you're working only with Asia, so, got Asia data here and then you want to um, essentially do a exactly you plotting year on the x-axis or yeah the year on the x and then like population oh population okay. um, uh, then I will let's group on uh, country GM lines, so yeah, we've got some sort of basic uh, plot like that. And then uh, you wanted to highlight which country? Cambodia, sorry. Cambodia, okay. So if we want to highlight Cambodia, there's a number of different ways we can uh, go about doing this. Um, one way would be to actually just create a little variable that is basically is Cambodia equals uh, if else country equals equals Cambodia, give it a, yeah, let's make it. All others, I'll explain this here in a second too. Uh, Cambodia. Okay, so it's kind of nestled down in the middle where it's kind of hard to see. If we change this to a logarithmic axis, it'll be slightly more visible. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and do scale y log 10. And you can kind of see it sitting in the middle of the pack. Um, so what I did here, and I'll answer the one in chat here in one second. Um, what I did here is I said, take the Gapminder data and then filter it down to only the countries in Asia create a new variable. This is a function I haven't introduced yet, but I will talk about on Wednesday. Mutate is for creating variables. So I said we're going to create a new variable that is a column called is Cambodia. 
It's going to be equal to an if else statement. I'm again gonna introduce this on Wednesday, which basically says if country is equal to Cambodia, make this is Cambodia variable equal to Cambodia. If this statement is false, make it all others. Uh, and then I just added it as a color here in the AES. Um, and so it colors it like that. So that's one way you could do it. And the way I would first think to, you could probably do it without creating a variable at all. Like, uh, this is more of a hacky way to do it. Which should work. Um, sorry, follow up questions. So when you want the lines to kind of separate and have more distance, do you always use the scale Y log 10? functions? Necessarily. Um, it, so I'm, I'm a demographer and as a demographer, I um, can't, I know what I'm doing. Cambodia. Uh, as a demographer, I would tend to expect um, <clears throat> populations to be sort of logarithmically distributed because they grow um, multiplicatively rather than uh, additively. Right, so a country that has a million people has a tendency to grow like 1% per year, like countries growing just like a thousand people regardless of the size of the country. Logarithms convert relationships into multiplicative ones. Things like GDP uh, and um, population are things that grow um, multiplicatively. I would expect them to be logarithmic. It's more just knowing. Sometimes you could do a square root scale or something else. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Let me see if this will uh, work. This might be a totally, yep, that'll do it too. This is a sort of a weird hacky way to do it. I set the color to be equal to a logical statement where if country is equal, equal to Cambodia, it will return a true and the true for that is, is there. It's kind of a hacky way, but it's a, a way you could do it quickly. I'd recommend doing it the first way. Let me go catch up with these ones in chat too. Okay, so uh, first one. Uh, I have the following questions. If we're doing a line graph, how can we put the label on the corresponding line on the graph? And can we just label two lines out of 10, for example, the lines I'm interested in? And then, uh, okay, we can do that. Did that answer your question about this first though? The colored yes. lines? Okay, so, oh, kind of check, pull down. Let me know if you've got more questions on this. I kind of zoomed through that one. Um, so this first one here. So if we want to put labels on these lines, let's use this as something to begin with. So I'm going to uh, start with this one up here. <clears throat> but what I want to do say is I want to label these lines. Well, if I want to do a label to it, a label is another layer on the plot. I'm going to call geom label. I'm going to say AEF. Uh, label equals country. Um, and you're going to see something ugly at first. You're probably going to see a label at every single data point for each country. <laughs> we don't want that to look that way because, for instance, this country, you know, India and every other country is observed many, many times. So this is basically drawing a label at every single observation. We might instead put them like at the end. To do this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, uh, yeah, what's the easiest way to do this? Let's go I swap to creating an object over here. Okay. And then what I'm going to do is something you haven't seen yet, I don't think. I'm going to plot using two different data sets at the same time. I'm going to say, I want to use as data, data equals Gapminder Asia, but I'm going to filter it down so that year is equal to the max of year, which is just the, the most recent year in the data. Well, the most recent year in the data should just be the labels over here on the far right. If I do this, we'll have them over there. They're getting truncated or not truncated, but cut off because the sort of plot window ends over here. So I might move them back to another year, or I could expand uh, the axis. So for instance, I could say, uh, I think it's limits equals, uh, let's go 1950 to like, let's see what 2015 looks like. Oh, is that not limits? Oh, because that's the Y scale. Silly Chuck. Uh, 
let's say, um, XLAM. I think XLAM just takes two arguments like that. So now they're somewhat more visible. If you have too many labels like this, it's going to be slightly problematic. But if you had a smaller number of countries, you could take this code and it would work better. But in your case, you're saying, can I label just two lines out of 10? Well, we can modify this, right? If I'm already using a second data set, why don't I just limit this down to the exact countries that I want? So for example, I'll just use this one. I could say filter down to country percent in Cambodia. And I'll just leave Bahrain on there for whatever reason. This is essentially saying, I'm going to make a new geom label layer on my plot. Uh, one second, I'm going to close this. So I'm going to holler into the kitchen. There we go. Okay. So uh, basically what I'm saying here is I'm going to make a new label I add to this plot. The data for it is only going to be my Gapminder Asia data in the most recent year and for only these two countries. Because I've, I've subset my data down to just this, the only observations that remain, so if I actually highlight this right here, you're going to see it's two rows of data. It's one row for Bahrain, one row for Cambodia. They're both in 2007, which is the most recent year. I'm plotting two data points, and they're just producing a label. It's a slightly more advanced thing than some of the stuff I've shown. It's the kind of thing that if you want to do it, you should play around with it and ask me questions when you break stuff. Uh, next one. Another follow-up. What's the difference between AES group equals country and not? Ah, well, let's see what happens. So if I take group equals country and remove it, what's going to happen is ggplot no longer knows how to connect the lines that go through each individual country. And so it draws a single line passing through all the observations in the data, except you'll notice for Cambodia. What it's done is it's assumed that because we want to color the lines by whether it's in Cambodia or not, it's automatically grouped only on the Cambodia variable, which makes one nice line for Cambodia, but then takes every other country year and connects them on a single line. So usually when you're doing a line plot, you're going to want to group on country to get something that looks like that. That makes sense. Those answer those questions so far, those first two. Okay, keep chugging along. Next one. Can we adjust the legend title without having to do the manual legend example coding? You absolutely can. So the interesting thing is, let's say I want to adjust, um, uh, like, is Cambodia over here? I can say, So the idea here is that, so like scale y log 10 controls my y axis over here, right? Well, this colors uh, like legend over here is being controlled by the color aesthetic. The color aesthetic scale attached to it is a scale color, and we're giving it a discrete or categorical variable. So scale color discrete will control it. I could actually change this to, let's make it country. This essentially is a quick way to change the title on a cut discrete color scale. It knows that that's what the legend is attached to. It goes and modifies it. If you had a, your legend controlled by something else, you'd have to use a different scale command. But basically, colors are almost always going to be a discrete scale. So you're probably almost always going to use this. There's also a direct way to change it in theme, I think, but I forget what it is off the top of my head. Okay. Um, ah, so next one. Uh, I'm going to keep working my way down. Keep populating the chat. I will eventually catch up with them. Uh, what's the main difference between filter and select? If I want to select the country China, it comes out to the same outcome. What's the main func? And then what's we use group? Ah, so filter and select are actually quite different things. So if I say here, country equals China, I'm going to get all the observations from China. If I say select here, I'm going to get an error. It's going to say object country not found. 
um, it's going to be a little bit confused by what we're doing. I could instead say, probably select this, and it's just going to give me the country variable. So I haven't introduced the select function yet, but select is for picking what columns you want. Filter is for picking what rows you want. So if you want to select a certain subset of rows, you want to be using filter. If you want to be selecting columns, you use select. Um, that's sort of just the distinguishing thing. The next is, uh, what's the main function when we use group and factor function? I'm not sure what you mean by that, and so you, you give me an example. Um, like punch in a chat and I'll, I'll talk about what you're meaning. Uh, next, uh, put my questions here. Thank you. Uh, one, how to change the legend title and its size. Legend title, well, we, I showed the legend title, but to change its size is probably in theme. Theme, I would say legend dot, uh, legend dot title, probably. Element text size equals maybe relative to. Gigantic. Okay. So what I just did there, and I wasn't saying what I was doing in case I was wrong. I don't always remember these things. Um, this is a little bit weird. This is getting into those theme calls in, in ggplot where um, you can manipulate everything manually. So here I say, okay, we're going to make some modification to the overall theme of the plot. <clears throat> what I'm going to modify is the legend, specifically its title, legend.title. Well, legend.title is a type of text. I know it's a text element because I just know how ggplot works and you'll learn these things over time. So I'm going to say it's equal to some element text and I'm going to change one parameter. So the default size would be size relative one. That is, one is a proportional difference. Size relative one. If I change this to relative two, it doubles the size of the text. Okay. So sort of a more advanced, complicated thing that requires some shenanigans. So, you know, if this doesn't make a huge amount of sense, that's okay. This is a complicated thing, but that would be exactly how you'd change that legend text size. Uh, the next, how to change the size of the output figure to appear smaller or bigger in HTML. That's actually not a ggplot thing at all. That is a thing you change in your chunk settings. Up here, you would say big dot width, say. If you want your plot to be nine inches wide, you would say like nine here. I think it's just the number nine for inches. Uh, big dot height would be like six. This would make a plot six inches tall and nine inches wide in your output document. So you controlled up in the chunk options. Um, next one, how to change the font size of the plot title. Uh, that's basically the same thing I just did over here, but an easier way might be to instead say like, um, uh, I changed the base size here. No, you can't change the base size here. You can do the same thing here. Um, what is that? Uh, plot dot title element text size equals say, relative to, but I don't have a title. I'll give you some big text there. You also notice my plot got all freaking chunky and huge when I did that because of that. There we go. So that'd be a way to adjust your title size. Um, so hopefully that answers what you're after. I'm gonna keep uh, hunting along. I've never had this many questions stack up in chat in a lab before. You've all set a record. So uh, let me uh, continue to punch through these. Uh, next, can I use filter country equals Cambodian Bahrain? You can, but it's not gonna give you the result that you think it should. Um, so what it's actually gonna do, so what percent in checks is to see if country is equal to either Cambodia or Bahrain. I'm gonna talk about this in class on Wednesday. If you do equals instead, it's gonna do something really weird. What it's gonna do is it's going to work its way through the entire list of data, alternating between checking whether it's Cambodia and checking whether it's Bahrain. So basically is you'll get any row where the uh, 
even numbered observations are Bahrain or the odd numbered observations are Cambodia. This is a thing called vector recycling we're going to talk about um, in a couple weeks. You'll want to use percentia. Um, next, I notice your R markdown codes have really helpful colors. Well, mine is all white text. How do you change this? Are you typing your code into chunks like this with tick, 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 squiggly R? Yes, I just caught that error, but it's still like mostly white text. Although like the, um, like the titles like uh, of things appear in green, but you have like a lot more color options within your code. Okay, so it might be the case. Uh, one thing to check is make sure your chunks aren't like, uh, so make sure everything is like gray in the background that you're typing code in. Yes, it is. Okay, and you don't have any kind of, you might check your color coding on global options um, appearance over here and check your editor theme. Some of them may have more or less colorful um, looks. I use twilight just because it's dark and it looks nice. Um, if that's not it, I might be able to directly troubleshoot because uh, it might be something weird and specific. Cool, thank you. I'll okay. try that. Next one, about project management. If we have a folder with markdown and R files for week two's lecture, do you recommend that I have a different folder for homework files for week two? Uh, nah, it's up to you. I mean, I, I, you could easily use one class, like one folder for the entire class with a single project. Um, it's up to you. I would actually say, now to think about it, use one project for the entire class, but I would use different folders for each homework. Um, this will be nicer later uh, when we get to like homework five or six when we're going to be automating the process of loading some data in from a directory and it's easier if it's in its own folder. Um, Next one. Ah, okay. Explain how scale color discrete controls the key title again. Yeah, it is kind of confusing and strange that this is how you do it. It's one of those peculiar ggplot things. So basically the idea in ggplot is that the thing that generates the legend down here isn't, is actually this aesthetic up here. Your legend is being generated by the color aesthetic. So if you want to modify the legend, you need to modify the aesthetic. And the way we modify how aesthetics map onto things is with scales. So you just know that if you want to change like how, um, let's say you want to change how Y relates to the plot, like instead of just being population like this, I needed to modify it to be a logarithmic axis. You're actually kind of doing the same thing here. You're changing how color is going to relate to the plot, but you're not changing the actual colors. You're just changing the name of the legend down here kind of a weird thing. I don't know that I, I would think that they would be nice if there was a more direct way to control this. But the reason there isn't is because you can have multiple legends in a plot. And so you need some way to control each of them. In this case, we only have one. So you control it with a scale function. The scale is going to be color because it's a color aesthetic generating the legend. And then you just control it with discrete down here because it's a categorical uh, scale. Color is almost always a categorical scale. It can be a gradient, but typically it's going to be categorical. It's just kind of its own weird thing. Um, and then I just say, give it the title. You're, technically speaking, um, if you look at the help, um, uh, I could specify, uh, there it is. Technically speaking, this first argument here is the name, but because it's the first argument that I, it's looking for, I don't have to name it down here. It just sort of works. Oops. Hopefully that explained it. If not, it's okay. I can attempt to. No, that was really helpful. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Next one. Is there a way to scale up and down everything of a caption by one simple code? So the, of a legend. Um, the easiest way would actually be to modify the overall text size of um, the plot. So for instance, I could just say, uh, uh, can I just do plot.text? Let's see. Now I want, um, Text, okay. So, well, there's a couple different things. So um, all the text in the legend, you could just do legend.text and say the exact same thing here. This should do it. Now it's all gigantic. I'm using the exact same command every time to do it. I'm just targeting different parts of the plot. So you can kind of, you know, adjust different things and it should cover it. Uh, next one, 
Uh, does fig.width and fig.size work with the cable function in knitter? No. No, it's specific to graphical outings, the text size or the contents of it. And there's a couple different ways you could do that. The easiest way would be to throw in a little uh, custom CSS or HTML above the chunk or something, but you could actually uh, um, throw in, uh, you could throw in a hook here, or uh, not a hook, but a, um, like some custom style here. Uh, where is it? There's a way to modify the uh, output style, but I forget offhand. Normally, you don't directly modify font sizes in a markdown document. So normally, what you'd want to do is you'd want to add something like uh, and modify a style sheet, give it a style or something like that. Or you could throw in HTML. I mean, you can you could basically huck in some HTML tags like that. I honestly, off the top of my head, don't even remember what the HTML tag to modify font size is. Um, but you could just huck in, you know, blah blah, a bunch of HTML here, and until you close that tag it will enlarge all the, uh, the text. In a PDF document, you need to use LaTeX. So you could use something like larger and LaTeX in to get a PDF. I saw one more question, yeah. uh, Chuck, because um, I have to run. Okay. Um, for the homework where we have to grade someone else's paper, it's just one, minimum one comment, right? Like one, like good overall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give a, yeah you're just kind of saying like, a general overall thing, like overall a good job, maybe consider doing this, or I like you did this kind of thing. Okay, all right, perfect. Thank you so much. Yep. Okay, and also, next one. Oh yeah. Sorry, for the peer review, do we need to give a grade for the homework? Yeah, give a number between zero and three. Zero is only if they didn't turn something in. Um, otherwise, that there's a rubric um, visible off of the website you can click on to see. Um, you know, but you know, don't worry too much about it. Like, you know, don't don't spend a bunch of time like worrying over it because I'm going to go through them all myself. It's more just like a recommendation. Thanks. Uh, so uh, basically, we only need to give a grade and also one or two comments. Yeah, just like little comments, like two or three sentences, really. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Next one. Uh, sorry to be asking. If I'm plotting life expectancy versus GDP per capita, I'm also plotting years as points in the graph to see the value of GDP and life expectancy each year. Legend here is a years. Can I still use scale color discrete to change the legend label? Uh, no, you instead of using scale color discrete. Um, so what what is year being mapped to? It depends whatever aesthetic it's mapped to. So it was just, I'm sorry. Yeah, it was just a graph and yeah, it was, yeah, it was like a line graph for one of the countries it was, um, uh, life expectancy versus GDP and the, uh, I can't remember, but yeah, the years, um, they were just like a scatter plot and I was just seeing like some linear regression or some sort of that thing. And like in the label, the years were kind of like a gradient kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I, I tried doing the discrete, but it wouldn't work. Um, I would have to, oh yeah, so it's actually, this is the thing, is because, well, year is a number, right? So it thinks it's a continuous variable. Mm -hmm. So because it thinks it's a continuous variable, you'll need to use scale color uh, continuous. But the better thing would be to convert it to a categorical variable and just stick with discrete. So you could just say, for instance, um, well, maybe not my, for, for color, it might be the best. So I'll give you an example of that. So here, how about we just go um, AES, let's go, uh, pop y equals, so I'm just going to use pop life expectancy arbitrarily, color equals year, jump scatter, uh, jump point. So I'm going to get something like that, kind of what I expect to see. Um, and so year it thinks it's continuous, so it displays it as a gradient. Well, you could just say, make it a factor, that is make it categorical. And then it's going to change the legend to be a categorical uh, legend. And then you could use scale color discrete if you want to mess with it. OK, thank you. That helps yeah. a lot. Depends what you want to do. If you want it as a continuous variable for whatever reason, like you want it to slowly kind of fade between different levels, you can leave it as continuous and mess with a uh, continuous. OK. Um, next one, uh, what does the percent in mean? Percent in actually means this. And I'll, I'll show you. So I'm going to. So 
up. Nope, Gap Midner. Um, okay. So let's say what I want for countries is, I could say, I want the United States and I want Canada in my data. This would give me mostly Canada. In this one, if I scroll down, you'll see the United States. Well, another way you could write this, and this is what percent in is actually doing, is I could say, well, I want the United States, or I want Canada. So this is saying, check to see if country is equal to the United States. If it's not, I would like you to also check and see if country is equal to Canada. If either of these is true, give me the data. Percent in here is a shorter, more compact way to write this exact thing. You can just add as many things as you want. I could then also say country equals like Mexico, where it's annoying because I keep having to type country equals equals, whereas up here, I could just add Mexico. And they're going to be exactly equivalent between the two of them. It's a shortcut. Uh, next, great, change in appearance to Twilight worked, and it's a much better, yes, it is a much better theme, that's why I've chosen it, it shows my good judgment. Uh, next, uh, does putting include equals false in the top of markdown file you do not have to type? You could, um, it's gonna be a little funny. Uh, so what, uh, include equals false in the top of a markdown file, you probably don't want it on the top of markdown file. So include equals false like this hides all output and all display of the code in the chunk. You wouldn't want to do it to every single chunk in your markdown because then you wouldn't see anything. Because if I do like include equals false here, and I, if I'm able to knit this, let me see. I should be able to knit that. You'll see here that the first code that you can actually see in my markdown document is Gapminder filter, filter country percent United States. You see how this chunk isn't visible at all? None of its output, none of its code. Include equals false hides all the code in the chunk and it also hides the output even if it's a plot. So include equals false is good for hiding like loading these packages and stuff, but it will hide literally everything. If you truly want no one to ever see what that chunk did or has in it, use include equals false. Otherwise, you probably want to use something else that's a little less heavy in. Um, if that makes sense. Next one. I noticed the help file for Gapminder dataset mentions country colors for a nicer color scheme for the countries. How would we use this? Yeah, I didn't actually know about that. Let me look. Oh, lovely. Color schemes for the countries and continents in the Gapminder data. Named character vectors giving country and continent colors. Oh, lovely. Okay. It's not a function. What is it? Is it just a vector? It's just a vector. Oh, well, that's beautiful. Well, in that case, you want to see how that works? This is fun. So let's get rid of this plot here, and I'm going to say, uh, let's make color is just equal to country. Okay, it's going to mess up because it's going to have a wonky legend. I'll show you. It's going to get a lot of different countries like this. Let's filter it down to a limited selection. I'm going to say uh, continent equals the Americas. Should be a more reasonable number. Okay. Well, now I'm going to say scale color this manual or no, it shouldn't be manual. It should be discrete and then, uh, no, that, sh that should actually be in manual, shouldn't it? Let me see what they're using for it. But scale color, yeah, manual. Okay. Okay, well, this is their color scheme that they've chosen for it. It looks like the Americas are all kind of fall colors over here for whatever reason. Um, I imagine if I picked a different continent. Yep, it looks like all the Asian countries are purple. The American countries are uh, kind of a fall oranges color. So for instance, if I say, let's not filter this and I'm going to Position equals none. 
Yeah, so actually what they've done here is these are uh, like Asian countries, the Americas are the orange stuff. I imagine uh, African countries might be the greenish ones. So what this has done is it said, I want to manually assign particular countries to particular colors. The way they're lining up is if I look at this vector of, of these uh, country colors here, this essentially what ggplot is doing is it's going and finding anytime a row's country is equal to Nigeria, it's going to assign this color code to it. Anytime it's Egypt, it assigns this color code to it. It's the same thing I did with the manual legend example in lecture. It was a named vector, but here's a really long one. So it's basically looking up by the names of the countries here and then assigning the colors to it. So it's a manual legend. It's just this vector I'm grabbing from somewhere else. That's actually a cool one. I, in the entire time I'm teaching this class, I never knew it was there. So good on you for looking on the help file. Um, yeah, so that's apparently how it works. Um, you could also do it with continent, or sorry, color equals continent, and then values equals, uh, I think it's continent colors. Yeah, and now we have continent colors. They're sort of fixed, but it's the same thing. Uh, these look like Asian countries and, and whatnot. Okay. Uh, so the next. I have a question. Oh, can we explain? Because there are two like color equal continent here, but in the different function, I think. Where? Uh, so I mean, there are two color equal continent. Yeah, and the next, and then continent and colors in the next line. I'm a little confused and can we explain that again? Yeah, well, okay. And so color equals continent here is saying, look in the Gapminder data for a column named continent, okay? This is saying something entirely different. This scale color manual is saying, these values here are gonna, are gonna be some vector of named values that are gonna be used to figure out how, for instance, different continents map onto different colors. So this isn't coming from the data up here. This is coming from this vector right here. This is basically what it's gonna do is, because there's only five continents in the data, for any row of data, like let's say it goes to the first row of data and the continent is Asia, this thing is gonna to go to scale color manual. It's gonna say, okay, I need to look up my values from this vector. To do that, it's gonna go look for Asia. It's gonna find it as the third one here. And then it's going to assign the color to that dot that's associated with this hexadecimal code. So this is of course sort of its own thing. This is the exact thing we did with the manual legend and lecture. So when you manually set a legend, I could instead say something like, to give you an idea what this is doing, I could say, okay, if the continent is Africa, I want the color to be blue. If the continent is Asia, I want it to be red. And so I'm actually gonna filter down to just those two continents so that you can see. And now you'd see these are the Asian countries in red and the African countries in blue. So I can do this manually like this. What this actual vector is of uh, continent colors that I was showing before. So if I change this back to, uh, continent colors, it's the exact same thing. I could create this vector manually where it would be Africa equals this, Americas equals this. This is the name, this is the value. That's all that thing is doing, if that makes sense. And if it doesn't, play with it a little bit and see. Thank you. Yeah. So the next one, um, ah, a faceting one, good. Okay, so I'm trying to facet wrap over all the countries and getting unreadably small graphs, even with n call equals of the height of each is short. What's the best way to get them readable again? Ah, the best way is to probably not necessarily facet wrap over all the 154 countries, if you have fewer countries, it might be more practical. With that many countries, it's gonna be a lot. Um, you're gonna get 154 plots, that's a ton. One thing you could do is you could paginate your output or something like that and limit it so you have a single page might have like four plots wide and like seven plots tall or something like that. Um, to do that, you'd need to use a uh, patchwork package might have it, or ggforce, one of those other packages, but it's not something I know how to do offhand. 
Um, the main thing is you probably just don't want 154 individual plots unless you really do. And if you do, you might have to shrink a lot of stuff. So for instance, uh, let's just insert one here. Say, Thank you. I realize this is kind of a, it's kind of a quixotic task to try to do, but since it came up, I thought, well, what is the technical answer? Yeah, well, let's, let's check it out. Uh, let's go with population. Um, and maybe not population. Let's go to GDP. Yeah. Um, and then I'm going to say asset wrap equals country. Then I'm going to get rid of some shit. Um, I'm going to say, uh, well, well, let's actually look. Let's um, not geopum. going to annoy me for trying 154 individual plots. Okay, so the issue here, one of the big ones, that you have all this text um, over the top, which is kind of, of course, shrinking out all the lines. So what we could do is I could say theme um, mm, strip dot text equals element text size equals relative 0.1. See if that helps break these up into their own lines. I begin to shrink it down. Now you're starting to see some lines. But the problem actually is that the strip itself is too big. So that's probably uh, strip dot uh, through the background. Dot background y. Hmm. Probably element rectangle. It's kind of strange it doesn't shrink on its own. This is actually a mysterious one to me. Um, unit. Point fill size, line border size, text size and points. Hmm, it's actually kind of a mysterious one. I don't know why the, the text should shrink with it. Um, channel strips. Hmm. hmm, this is a mysterious one. What is the easiest way to mess with it? Uh, yeah, this is a good question. I would Google it. There's probably some a good example for how to do many of them because there are sometimes many good reasons to do lots and lots of plots. It's called small multiples in visualization terms. Um, you might just go and look and see if there's a way to suppress or shrink the strip background easily. It's probably I have to set something manually with element rectangle, but I'm not sure off the top of my head what's the easiest way to do it. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Next one. Uh, can you go back and explain line 16 confused about the factor year part? Yeah, so that was done a while ago, and so it's around here somewhere. Uh, oh, yeah, I remember what that was. That was me doing um, uh, for instance, color equals year. Yeah, point. Okay, uh, one second. <laughs> I don't know what kind of pollen or something is in the air, but I cannot stop sneezing today. Um, so basically the idea here is that um, year is a numeric variable. Because it's a numeric variable, it's, it's sort of just displaying it as a gradient. So early years are really dark and new years are really bright. But we might not want to treat it as a numeric variable. Maybe what we actually are thinking of is thinking of it as a categorical variable and we want like a different color for every year that isn't in some continuous gradient. If I wrap this in factor, factor just converts a variable to a categorical variable. Now it just thinks they're categorical unordered data and it just makes its own label for each one of them and they don't have any logical order to them. 
This is just converting to a categorical variable. We're going to talk a lot about factors in week uh, like five and again in week eight. Um, so we'll get there, but for now, it's just a way to convert things to categorical. Thank you. Uh, and so the next one is on that same thing. Do you mean plus scale color discrete country equals? Uh, no, not exactly. So if I wanted to modify this color scale now, I would go like scale color discrete because it's a discrete variable. If I change this to no longer be a discrete variable and left it continuous, I would have to change this to continuous to do things like change the legend, like for instance, uh, say it's capital year here. If I do factor here, change this to discrete. Oh, except I misspelled factor because I'm typing too fast. No, not factotor. Okay. There we go. So you just have to use different ones and uh, the one that matches up with the type of variable you're giving it. And when in doubt, Try one, if it doesn't work, swap to the other one. Uh, next, let's see. Uh, I don't like that plots appear in the R markdown under as I'm coding it up. How do we disable this? Oh, you can absolutely disable that. Go into global options, uh, go into R markdown, and then um, show equation and image previews in a pop-up or never. And so I think that might do it. It's that or... Um, turn out inline output. Uh, I forget which one of them it is. Mess with these over here in our markdown and you'll find it. Um, yeah, I'd poke around in there and you'll see. One of them should do the job. If not, let me know. Uh, next, what is the shortcut for percent in? You know, I don't know off the top of my head. Oh yeah, they made it so it's a website. Um, let's see. Percentian not found. Uh, okay, let me see. Completions, editing, insert. Time operator. Huh, they don't actually show there being a shortcut, so uh, I don't know if there is one. You might be able to add one, modify keyboard shortcuts, and then uh, add one somewhere. As you can see, there's quite a few options, and one of them is probably, um, yeah, you could probably add one, customized, fold other. Probably some way to just add a new one in here somewhere. You'd have to hunt around for it though. Kind of hard because in is a really common pair of letters. Um, yeah, I have to pump around, but you should be able to add it somehow. I forgot off the top of my head how. Uh, next, oh, there's a good one. Can you go through building a histogram? Yes, because histograms are strange. Okay, so uh, let's do a histogram. Let's do a histogram of say, population. Well, the interesting thing about a histogram is that histograms usually just have an x-axis, okay? Because they just have um, a frequency you calculate um, and that's it. So I can go geom histogram. And this is the histogram of population. Most populations are down there. So let's swap to something more like um, life expectancy. Kind of what you'd expect life expectancy is mildly bimodal. One big peak in sort of uh, developed countries and kind of split more over the rest of the countries in the world. So what's going on here is it essentially is taking the life expectancy variable in Gapminder and it's running a command on it before plotting it. What it's actually doing behind the scenes is going, well, it's not exactly counting, it's, uh, it's binning it and then counting it. Um, I can't show you the tabulation though because there's no good quick way to get into it. Basically you see here it's saying stat bin using bins 30. 
what this is saying is by default, geom histogram is saying, okay, we're gonna take our continuous data and set up 30 bins. It's so basically our data are gonna be grouped into 30 evenly spaced categories. If I change the number of bins, the bars get wider because more data is being gathered into each bin. If I do like 10 bins, their 10 bins are gonna be like eight or nine years wide. I could do something like 100 bins and it's going to have basically one bin per year in the data. Okay. And then the, this is going to show the number of country years underneath each one of these, um, which I could then highlight by doing something like, okay, let's go with common. Actually, I don't want color. This is a different aesthetic, it's called fill. So this is now showing the contribution of each one of these continents to the overall distribution of country years of uh, um, life expectancy. This is a fairly complicated thing, but if you look here, you'd see most of the African countries have low life expectancy, so they contribute to the density on this side. The European countries overall have very high life expectancy, so they're mostly contributing over here, so on and so forth. Um, this is a grouped histogram. Normally the type of histograms you'd normally encounter are gonna be basically just like something like that, a plain histogram. Um, works for any continuous variable. Did that answer that or did that introduce more confusion? No, that's a good basic, yeah. Okay, yeah, histograms are um, basically only get an X because what it's gonna do is it's gonna put the values of that variable on the x-axis, and then it's gonna put the count of observations within each one of those bins on the y-axis, so it's generating its own y-axis. Thus, you only give it an x. That's really helpful, thanks. Yeah. Uh, next one, oh yeah, there you go. Strip background, element rect, yeah, fill. Oh yeah, knock it out, make it gray, reduce the spacing, remove the strip all together. Yeah, okay, there you go. Um, okay. So next, is there anything that people need me to go back to, walk through something more slowly, answer other particular questions now that I'm caught up? I lost my uh, internet connection about the time you were describing the difference between filter and select oh, yeah. columns versus rows. Do you mind repeating that? I think it should be quick. Don't mind at all. And you're gonna get a lot of it on Wednesday. <clears throat> um, so just as a heads up, I'll say it now, but Wednesday we're gonna spend a bunch of time on it. Um, so basically, uh, filter, right, is, is for picking rows. If I say filter uh, country equals uh, Yemen, it's going to, oh, did I, is Yemen not in the data? Or did I, there we go. Yemen must not be in the data. Yeah, okay. Um, so if I select Oman over here, uh, I will get all the rows in the data that are Oman. What select does is completely different. So this keeps every column in the data set but then gives me certain rows. Select does the opposite. Select gives me every row in the data so far, but only certain columns. So I might say like, give me year and country. Well, now I only have year and country and it drops everything else. Select gets rid of, uh, gets rid of or keeps columns. Filter gets rid of or keeps rows. Thank you kindly. Anything else? Also happy that I said to revisit earlier questions if I wasn't making sense. I was talking kind of fast to try and catch up, which may have been counterproductive in a lab. <clears throat> I have a question and it's just quicker for me to ask it instead of typing it, but um, is the select function the easiest way to just like look at a subset of your data? Well, it depends if it's a subset of columns or rows, but yeah. Um, I mean, what are you after? Um, like this would be an example, but I know that you said um, filter was more for columns, right? And select is more for rows. Other way around. So select only only keeps uh, columns that you ask for, basically. <clears throat> so here I'm just saying, give me the year and the country. So it dropped everything else. But you'll notice it still has 1,704 rows. It didn't touch the rows. <clears throat> okay. Here, filter messes with the rows. If I filter here, I've only got 12 rows of data, but I have every single one of the columns. They're just totally unrelated operations. 
Um, it's just filters for picking out the rows you want, select is for the columns you want. Okay, that's helpful. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and we'll get a ton of examples of these on Wednesday. As is classic in labs, we're all kind of jumping ahead here when um, Wednesday is entirely on how to use filter and select and a couple other commands. So we'll see lots of examples. Okay, so this next one here, stat equals smooth, method equals lowest mean in the following code. Ah, this is an excellent question, which I, uh, I believe I briefly mentioned, um, uh, maybe even in the last lab. Okay. Ah, so I wouldn't use a lowest for this. I'm going to show you, I'm going to do instead of country, I'm going to do continent here. Um, okay. So what a geom smooth does, right, is a, a geom smooth draws a <clears throat> smooth conditional average line through all your data points. So if I do something like, um, I'll try and illustrate what we're uh, actually doing here. Let's go group equals continent here, group equals country. Um, and I'm going to say geom line color equals black uh, equals 0 0.5, size equals 0 0.5, and then I'm going to say color equals red. Oh, did I mess that up? Yes, yeah, group equals continent, stat equals smooth, GMI method equals stat equals smooth. And color equals red. Why is that not working for me? I'm doing something dumb here. Color equals black, group equals country. Oh, it's still grouped on, yeah, it's still grouped on country. I'm curious. Oh, no, there's no plus sign. Really, Chuck. There we go. So basically, uh, actually, how about I go like this? Mm. Eh, I'll leave it like this. So what the lowest line is doing is this lowest line right here, for instance, is passing through all of the different observations for the countries in that particular continent, and it's just taking the average at each year of them, right? It's passing through the middle. What this here is saying is the formula it's using to calculate this line, it's assuming what you want is a linear relationship of y on x, and it's by default using a standard lowest smoother right here, which is sort of a, a curvy line, but not perfectly curvy. It doesn't like curving way too much up and down. Rather, it likes to curve only a certain amount. You could change this method to LM. And LM, a linear model, can only fit a perfectly straight line. And so you'll notice that the red lines are now straight lines through all this. They can't bend. So what that thing is basically telling you is, I could also say, formula equals y tilde x here, and it no longer tells me that warning because that was the default. I can manually set it. I could then do something like, let's do a linear model, but let's make it a linear model with a quadratic function, and now they all have slight curvatures to them. You can actually specify a formula like you would in a regression model, if you're familiar with how to specify them in R, um, and this thing is just saying, if you don't specify these things, like if I remove them here, it sets some defaults for you, but it lets you know what those defaults are. That's all it's doing. This is what I would do if you don't tell me what to do, but you can do this here and specify it and the warning goes away. That makes sense? Yeah, that, that helps, but I'm still mm -hmm. confused about the state, the states equal smooth parts. Mm -hmm. So stat equals smooth is changing the way the line is being drawn. The way that I've drawn this line or normally would draw this line is instead of saying stat equals smooth, I would actually say, call this geom smooth like that. Um, so stat equals smooth is just sort of specifying um, that you want to draw a smooth line. I would normally recommend instead using geom smooth, which is an entirely different geometry. This one also gives you confidence intervals, which you can probably just barely see in there. 
Um, stat equals smooth is just a way to tell it how to draw the lines based on, instead of drawing them based on a, a, um, the data you're providing it, it's summarizing the data first. So stat equals smooth says, I want to take the variables you're giving, in this case, it's year and life expectancy, and it's going to take uh, those data and summarize them in some way. And so in this case, I grouped on continents, so it's summarizing within each continent and drawing one line through each year. So it's one line through each year summarizing life expectancy. Yeah, it's kind of like, it's kind of complicated. It's a bit easier to get intuitively than how it's being done mathematically. That helps, thank you. Okay, um, next one. I'm confused by facet wrap and facet grid. Okie dokie. I'll give you an example here using, um, facet grid is hard to do with the gap minder data. So as an example, I'm gonna use a different data set. Uh, this data set MT cars is built into R, it's motor trend cars, it's a bunch of car performance information. It's nice because it has a lot of categorical variables. So I'm going to say, take MT cars, PG plot, uh, let's say on the X axis, I will have uh, weight. On the Y axis, I'll have miles per gallon, heavier cars eat more gas. Um, but then I'm going to say, let's facet grid so that on one side, we'll stratify it by uh, the number of cylinders in the car, and on the other side, whether it's an automatic or manual transmission. Um, G on point, uh, and why don't I do something? I'm gonna mix it up. Let's also go uh, color equals um, amount of horsepower. So what this facet grid has done is it's taken the number of cylinders, which you'll notice here, the tilde here is a formula. Things on the left side of the formula are on the y-axis, and so it's kind of running up and down. Things on the right side tend to be on the x-axis. This is the automatic transmission versus manual transmission. This here is the number of cylinders in the car. So it's stratified the plot, but so for instance, this one right here, is a vehicle for which AM is equal to one and cylinder is equal to four. And then all of these data points are those cars. Does that make sense? It's a way to create sort of stratified uh, subsets of plots on categorical variables. Yeah, thanks Chuck. I am just confused. What is the difference between these two? Oh yeah, so facet wrap is a little bit different because you usually only do over one variable. You can't facet wrap over, uh, so if I say facet wrap AM, it's gonna do one here and one here. If I do at cylinder, it's gonna run them left to right. If I had more of them, they'd eventually wrap to the next row and keep doing it like a go four, six, eight, 10, 12, 16. So I'll make a couple 16 cylinder cars, but they do that. Wrap just means it keeps going, making more and more rows until it runs out of plots to draw. So if you're doing something like country, you'd probably do country and wrap because you have lots and lots of countries you just want them to run in alphabetical order. But if you have like two categorical variables, you probably want a grid. So sort of different purposes. Um, sorry, Chuck, just to follow up on that. So if in, when you're doing the facet grid, you have the X, Y rows of um, MPG and WT. Are they also correlated to the cylinder? Well, they might be correlated. Um, so the idea is that in all of these things, you see weight is running across on the bottom. So these are cars going from weighing, uh, it's probably in thousands of pounds. So going between like 2,000 and over 5,000 pounds here, the scales are, are the axes are actually the same for all these different plots. And you can kind of see, for instance, the eight cylinder cars tend to be heavier and get worse gas mileage. The four cylinder cars up here tend to get good gas mileage and be really lightweight. Um, but all of the axes are the same between all four plots. Is that what you're asking or? Yeah, I, I guess I'm just confused where the four and O and one on the top come from? Uh, they're coming from the AM variable. So these are the values of the automatic transmission variable. Um, it doesn't automatically label to say what it is. You just would know it's there. Kind of like if you put country there, it would just put them on the facet labels. So normally what you'd want to do is I would actually do something more like um, uh, mutate um, auto equals if else AM is equal to zero. Otherwise, it's manual. And 
now it would say automatic and manual. I would probably use categorical variables like that, that that convey some information so you don't have to label them. AM being zero and one doesn't mean anything. It's hard to even tell what variable it matches to. But by creating a new variable for auto, I know, oh, it's an automatic or a manual transmission. Um, gotcha. You know. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, I have a follow up question. Yep. So if we change the order of the CYL and uh, Author, yeah, here, can we get a different picture or they are the same? Ah, so if I, if I flip them? Yeah. Yeah, if I flip them, it's going to be different. They're going to be, now cylinder is going to be going across here and automatic is going to be going the other way. So this is just controlling which one is on the Y side and which one is on the X side. So this is Y, this is the X, so Y and X. Thank you very much. That's helpful. Next one, my X and Y variables are overlapping because the numbers are big. What's the best way to manipulate X, Y numbers so they fit on the axis properly? So you're in a situation where uh, they get, they're really, really big. Well, it depends what the case uh, you're looking at. So um, what variables are you looking at? Are you using Gapminder or are you doing something else? Yeah, I'm using Gapminder and I was looking at the GDP per cap and the life expectancy, but I was trying to facet wrap it for like countries in the Americas and it, um, the like X axis, like all the numbers are overlapping and I wasn't sure if I should change the size of the text or if there was a way to manipulate it differently. Uh, there's a couple things. Uh, what do you have your exact plot code so it doesn't work with that and modify it? Nice to just see the exact case and I'll mess with it. Okay, pull that out. Okay. Okay. So, ah, uh, yeah. So, continents. Okay. Let's see what this looks like. Hmm. Okay. Ah, uh, so you're just talking about the. You're fine with the overall look of the plot, but the numbers over here are messed up. They're like overlapping, and you want to get rid yeah, of. Yeah, and I've I've just had that happen a few times, so I was just wondering. Okay, well, one thing we could do, uh, with something numeric, the easiest thing to do is to rescale the variable itself. I would say uh, take GDP per cap and make it equal to, um, in, make it in thousands of dollars. Um, and now in thousands of dollars, they're not gonna overlap, right? So uh, that might be helpful. Um, usually the one of the first things I think of is rescaling. All those zeros aren't really conveying any information, right? Um, maybe even make it 10 thousands. And now it's just running from zero to four. Um, zeros are useless, so might as well just cut them off. That's one way you could do it. Um, another thing you could do, uh, so like let's say we wanted to leave it with some zeros for whatever reason. Um, other options would be to have fewer of them. So you could, you could manually set like um, uh, scale X continuous. You could set the breaks to be at like Let's say zero, um, like 200 and 400. Then I'd have fewer breaks. Um, and another thing you could do, and I'm not a big fan of it, but it's kind of, it's fun. You could say um, uh, access dot text dot x equals element text uh, angle equals 45 and rotate the text. Normally you'd want to also uh, H justify it. Uh, oh, other direction. Uh, like that. And so if you have something you can't trim down, like categorical labels and you don't want to abbreviate them, you could rotate them like that. It might be a little finicky, um, but that's one option. Awesome, thanks. Yeah. Uh, here's a good question. How do we make one specific line thicker than the others? Did a graph of life expectancy, but you want to make the US line thicker. Couple options for doing that. Um, so an easy way, uh, do I have a good example plot to start with? 
Uh, yeah, let's make a new one. So, uh, like expectancy, um, and then. up something here and I forget what I'm doing. Oh, mutate death. Okay, so I have a big mess of crap and I would like to color just the United States. So uh, there's a couple things you could do. You could literally, and this is sort of the crude way to do it, you could say uh, color equals country equals United States. The United States is now going to be the one blue. Oh, you said not color but size. Uh, yeah, easiest way would be to create a variable. You could do this with size too, but it's going to be kind of hard to, uh, to see because it's in this case it made, uh, yeah, using size for discrete variables not advised. Um, I would say the thing to do would be to go uh, mutate if else. Okay, um, so you could do that. Uh, I know they say discrete variable on advice. Let's also go size equals or, uh, color equals US. And I get grumpy with you, but essentially you could do something like that. You might have to manually set the values to make it not ugly. Um, in this case, I could say uh, scale size manual. Values equals uh, uh, make US equal to one, make not US equal to 0 0.25, and eh, make the US a little bit bigger. Then. So now the US is kind of the big one, and the other ones are kind of small ones. So this would also be an example of using a manual, uh, like uh, essentially a manual scale or legend. Does that make sense or did I just confuse you? Yeah, um, I, I tried actually the first thing that you did and I got that same warning of like, mm -hmm. it's not advised to use this. Um, so. Yeah, if you're gonna use a discrete variable mapped to size, you probably want to manually set the values so that they don't get weird. And so that's what I did here is I basically said, scale size manual, the values for that are going to be US is going to be equal to two, not US is going to be equal to 0 0.25. So I made the US line big and everything else small. Manually setting them is probably the way to go. Thanks. And so the idea is basically in ggplot, everything that you're going to map to anything else, any, anything that's going to be can, that's um, going to be displayed like using a variable like this in here needs to be something in the data. So essentially with this, I just created a new not US versus US column and then mapped it on like it was already in the data. Almost everything is not something you're going to set manually, but rather you'll like create something in the data and then throw it into ggplot afterwards. Um, okay, so would you like to elaborate what kinds of observations and words for graphs you want us to write in the homework? Oh, you know, just kind of, I, I, I'm not looking for anything specific. I mean, let's say you did this sort of plot like this. You might just say something. If you were going to do a plot like this, you might say something like, you know, overall, you know, countries' life expectancies were increasing at this time. The U.S. is generally pretty close to the top. Um, that kind of thing. It's just like you're just saying what you're saying. Just to show, like, I know what my plot is displaying, but don't go crazy. You know, this isn't a class about writing or interpreting these things. It's just there to basically give a little bit of text so you're not handing somebody, like, 10 plots with no explanation in them, you know. That's about it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, next one, is there manual instruction about all the essential ggplot codes? Uh, yeah, there's tons of good documentation out there. Um, so uh, the actual ggplot documentation isn't always the easiest thing. Um, so for example, the ggplot website right here has a, um, 
a lot of information, including things like these nice cheat sheets, uh, which would show all the different sort of geometries and the kind of things that they generate. You know, so inst for instance, in this class, we've been doing a lot of uh, um, where it's like uh, geom points and things like that, like geom point here, we've been using a lot of geom smooth, we use a lot of, um, you know, geom lines and things. Um, but there's a lot of these different geometries and a lot of arguments that can go in them. As you can see, there's a million things in it. ggplot is not the sort of thing where um, you're going to be able to like memorize everything. Um, uh, I know a pretty large amount of ggplot from constant use and the fact that this is like my eighth or ninth term teaching this class. Um, but unless you also did that, I wouldn't expect you to be able to memorize these things as well as like I have them memorized. And on top of it, you'll see I'm frequently still Googling things and using the help files. The gist of it is that, you know, you, you, you might want some reference or something, but I typically, if I don't know how to do something, I'm just Googling stuff. It's more figuring out the vocabulary um, and stuff. I wouldn't call anything essential aside from the most basics like geom line, geom point, the ggplot call itself, maybe knowing that the theme exists and scales do, but honestly, I search for almost everything. If I, if I don't remember how to do something, you just kind of learn it by using it. Um, but yeah, the, the sort of official documentation is one place, but you know, there's a lot of stuff. Um, and even this documentation isn't the most useful thing in the world. I would recommend, honestly, using a, a, a textbook like, uh, um, uh, let's see. Yeah, like Kieran Healy's book or something like that. Um, where's the actual book? Um, on our publications? No. Resources? No. Where's your data viz book? Why is it not? I forgot to just click on it. No, that's the Amazon link. It used to be free and online here. It's still here. Socialist. Okay. Yeah, something like this uh, book is a uh, is pretty terrific. So, for instance, you might be like, oh, okay, well, how do I do something like, um, you know, how do I do facets? You know, this sort of thing would show you how to do different sorts of faceting of plots. Uh, notice he's using the Gapminder data too. Uh, it's a great data set for examples. Um, and I just kind of like read this sort of thing. I find this stuff to be often more useful um, if you're newer than um, sort of documentation. The documentation tends to not be the most useful thing in the world. Like for instance, uh, this stuff that I'm showing you is like how to use theme. I don't expect that this makes any sense to you. So the, the default documentation is not usually ideal. Um, it's kind of better to use some like resource like this or use things like the, uh, um, our graphics cookbook, um, another online textbook, being like, well, how do I make something like, how do I make a box plot? Go over here and this would show you examples of how to make like uh, box plots using both base R graphics and ggplot graphics. This sort of thing like the cookbook is one of the best ways if you just know exactly kind of what you want. You're just gonna scroll down the left until you find the thing you're after and then pick that thing and it shows you how to do it. Like, okay, I've got a scatter plot. I want to put a regression model on it. How do I do that? This would show you how to do add regression models to a, a scatter plot. Cook pl cookbook is probably the best way to, to go, probably for, uh, yeah. And all these things are linked up probably off my course website. Yeah. Cool, thanks. Um, may I know that the, the visualization website is just the book that you recommended uh, in last class? Yep. Yeah, it's Kieran Healy's, uh, so it's at sociaviz.com. Um, oh, not sociaviz. I thought it was sociaviz. Oh, it's probably sociaviz.org. No, not that guy. Don't autocomplete. Okay. Not CL. Yeah, uh, that's Kieran Healy's book. Um, but honestly, there's a lot of good textbooks for different purposes, like that R Graphics cookbook I just showed a second ago is a good reference one. It's probably a better reference than Kieran Healy's. But if you're going to walk through an entire book, Kieran Healy's is my favorite for a walkthrough. Um, that or uh, uh, 
Klaus Wilkie's uh, Fundamentals of Data Visualization. Um, this is also a terrific uh, um, book that mostly uses ggplot. Um, they're all a little different. In an ideal world, one would use all of them and kind of master it all simultaneously. If I was going to choose one, I'd probably take Kieran Healy's book for a learner. Um, if I was going to choose one as a reference to keep on your bookshelf, I'd take the R Graphics Cookbook. Okay. Anything else? I'll let you all mull for a second. I can still answer things. Oh man, allergies are killing me today. Freeze dried nettles, better than Benadryl. I'm trying to take anything myself, but uh, usually I just sort of suffer through it. The punishment makes me feel better. Might not be a bad idea though. Let's see if it gets bad. Usually it lasts for like one or two days and that's just gone. I don't know what it is though. Might also be like a lack of sleep. I don't know. It's been a very busy thing like the last week and a half for me. Oh, feel free to poke at your stuff. I'm not going to go anywhere until 520. Um, just feel free if, uh, to ask questions or uh, whatnot. I'll just lurk. You can also ask, of course, non-ggplot things, basic questions. Uh, anything tangentially related, I don't mind. If nobody else is asking any questions, you can feel free to probe for other things or whatever. Absolutely. No, basic is fine. I, I actually, um, the basic questions are sort of like the most illustrative ones because mostly special topics type ones. It's like you may never even have to do that. So something like that is great. Um, so let's see. Um, just show a GDP versus life expectancy graph. Okay. Well, I'm just going to say, I'm just going to do all the countries. I'm just going to say ggplot. Let's take the Gapminder data. My aesthetics are going to be uh, so. Let's just say uh, x equals GDP per capita, y equals uh, life expectancy. Um, then I might do something like, um, yeah, I mean, you could do, the on point is, oh, it's life exp. You're gonna get some kind of plot typically that looks like that. It's a sort of typical for, um, things where one of the axes is sort of logarithmically distributed like the bottom, but this would be a pretty simple plot where um, you've got, you know, 
that in life expectancy. We might add something like color equals continent to see those continent level differences. Um, you'll see, of course, that because of the way GDP per capita is, all these African countries, for instance, all tend to have very low GDP, so they're all compressed down here. The European ones tend to sit up here. You might consider a different axis to make it look a little bit more readable, like scale x log 10. And then GDP per capita and life expectancies, it turns out, have a log linear relationship like this. So if I, if I take the logarithm of GDP per capita and leave life expectancy linear, we get this big kind of normal looking envelope of scatter plot points. Um, and then that would show. This might not be the exact information you want because for instance, every country has 12 data points shown here. You might instead say something like, and so this is me just illustrating how you can keep building on this. You might go facet wrap, uh, here, I'll break these into their lines so you can see that they're all just different commands. Now we have a life expectancy on GDP per capita scattered plot where every year gets its own plot. So you can kind of iterate and add to these things. So it starts with that super basic graphic, but then just tag things on. If that any of that stuff is confusing in any way, zip yourself back to the most basic one, delete something and see how it adds or removes things. Do you have any questions about that? I'll move on to these next ones in a second. Sorry, I have one follow-up question for this picture. Yeah. Oh, I noticed that like, we use log, log 10 frequently. I wonder, can we explain the function of log 10? So what? Explain the function? Uh, no, uh, I mean, can we explain why we use log 10 for the data? Yeah, um, so logarithms just have the nice property of um, compressing axes a little bit. So um, to give you an idea, I mean, if I illustrate this, I could say, for instance, um, x equals 1 to 100, uh, log x equals log 1 to 100. Actually, should I do it that way? Yeah, I can do that. Jump. I'm gonna do line here. I wanna do X What am I trying to do here? I forgot already what I was trying to do. Why don't I just go uh, plot So the nice thing about logarithmic axes, right, is as, in this case, this is x increasing from 0 to 1. As x increases from 0 to 1, instead of increasing linearly with it, it increases really quickly early and then really descends like that. Because of that natural curvature, it means that when we plot something like uh, GDP per capita, which has lots of really low values and relatively few high values, it shrinks together the things at the top and spreads out the things early on. So if you have any kind of an axis that has lots of low values, lots and lots and lots of low values and relatively few tie ones, if you take a logarithm of it, it will spread out the ones you care about at the bottom end. So pragmatically, like practically speaking, um, they're really good for expanding something like that. Um, in a more theoretical sense, uh, logarithmic scales are really good for any sort of thing that you suppose has a multiplicative relationship over time. Um, so there's a lot of things that increase or decrease additively, but if things increase and decrease multiplicatively, like for instance, population, right? The difference in the year-to-year -year population change in a country like China is, is percentage-wise similar to the population growth in a lot of smaller countries' percentages, but the raw numbers are massively different, right? You could easily have your population increase by like a million, you know, millions of people, right? In a, a million people in a year. You can't have that in a country that's really, really small because they just don't have enough possibility to have that many births. The thing is, though, is that the, the population growth in China might still be the exact same percentage as like some tiny little country, right? And so that's something that's logarithmically related. And so multiplicative stuff is good for that. 
GDP per capita is something where the GDP of a country goes up and down in proportion to its current GDP. The United States like, can have fluctuations of you know, a GDP per capita of $1,000 in a year, just massive. But a country that only has a GDP per capita of $1,000 is probably only going to go up $10, $20, $100 or something year to year. So use logarithm. My advice is if you're not, if, if you get a compressed scale like this, just try to take a logarithm of like X and see what happens. Because you kind of see how it, all of these plots kind of look like they have a curve up and down like that. Well, that's the shape of a logarithm, right? The logarithm is a curve like that. Try and take a transformation that has the same shape as what you see. If you do it, it has a tendency to turn it into a straight line. It's kind of just one of those things. Okay, next one. Uh, so Nancy says here, a dumb question. Can R do stuff SQL does? Absolutely. In fact, if you're already working somewhere or working things where your, your stuff is in a relational database, you can make your SQL queries straight from R. You don't have to pull them out of the database. So you can just do your queries to it. Um, I am in the social sciences and social scientists seem to have a, a um, are deathly afraid of relational databases and store everything in Excel files. So I rarely get the pleasure of working with SQL commands, but it's obviously the ideal way to store um, any sort of multiple tabular data. Um, it's much better if it's in a SQL one. You can either use this direct SQL queries um, uh, or you could like, I mean, there's all sorts of different interfaces. There's RODBC is a um, R's open database connection. So if you've got any kind of a database, you can probably talk to it directly from R. And so it can do everything SQL can do. Yeah, for sure. SQL's just sometimes faster and easier for some common operations. Yeah, RODBC is for the is the open database uh, connection system for uh, R. There's a few different ones. There's some database specific packages for certain things. Like there's one that's specific for like um, Microsoft Access. Uh, there's there's other ones like that. Um, if you're working in one of those, uh, uh, I forget what's the name of the sort of um, Apache uh, the um, Apache oriented database one is a specific package for it to attach to Spark and things like that. Depends what you're doing. There's something out there um, for it. Um, if you already have stuff in the database, you know, I, SQL is fantastic. I would use, do many of my normal queries. I would do some, something with SQL rather than worried about pulling things into R. Though, as you'll see later, um, the stuff in R is often basically equivalent. Sometimes it's even the same amount of code. Sometimes the syntax in R is easier though than SQL. Not always, but every once in a while. SQL is still like essentially the most marketable skill a person could possibly have in general uh, um, data work and industry. So it's worth picking up if you're not going to be in like academia. I haven't gotten to touch a relational database like my entire time in UW because nobody uses them. So. <clears throat> ah, so here we go. Save new dot object file equals uh, ah incomplete expression. Save new dot object. Yeah. So the issue here is the uh, probably the parentheses around new dot object there. Um, it can't save a file name probably that looks like that. I'm not positive, but I would suspect that's what it is. Um, oh yeah, you need to close the parentheses after it. So it should be, and I'll just type it right back in the chat. It should be like um, you probably want that instead. I can see how that may have been mistyped pretty easily. Um, next one. Go over how to change these um, on the x-axis on the scrap. Oh yeah, so um, I changed it to a logarithmic x-axis and so by default so I've just hucked it over to scientific notation. There's a couple different things that I could do. The easiest thing that I could do would actually be to modify my data. If I say gapminder mutate uh, I'm going to call this GDP per cap uh, 1K equals uh, GDP per cap divided by 1,000. Uh, 1,000 doesn't do it. Uh, 10K? Oh, I'm using the wrong variable. There we go. Okay. So what is happening is once it gets to a certain number of zeros being displayed, it's like that number is really big. I'm assuming you want it in scientific notation. 
You probably don't, but it's gonna do it. Another thing I could do instead of rescaling the variable. So here I rescaled it by um, turning GDP per capita into thousands. So you see, this is a GDP per capita of $1,000, $10,000, $100,000. This is the nice thing about multiplicative scales too, right? It goes from one to 10 times to 100 times in equal distances. That's the compression of the uh, logarithmic scale. Um, I could instead use like the scales package. I could go like, uh, let's change this back to GDP per capita and then say, um, so yeah, labels, it's labels, yeah, labels equals scales dollar, uh, you'll see now it's like $1,000, $10,000, $100,000, you can't see them very well, so I could rotate that to be, um, this dot, uh, text dot x, Now you can kind of see that they're uh, now it's thousand dollars, ten thousand, one hundred thousand. So if you don't want them in scientific notation, one of your options is to um, rescale the variable. But another one could be just to apply a scale transformation like this. There's a whole bunch of these in the scales data set. In this case, we're working with dollar data, so I just did scales dollar. Um, if you're working with something else, you could do in something else like uh, so. If I get help on this. I can look in the scales package and go to like, uh, what our options are there? Label number, um, I could rescale it as a, you know, some kind of a number, something logarithmic, um, all sorts of things. You can look in here and try other functions, like for instance, label number, uh, comma, what would comma do here? Yep, now I just made them 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 with nice commas in them. To do number, number would just make them 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 and leave them as numbers. I'd do a transformation like that probably. Does that make any sense or do I just confuse the shit out of you? Uh, oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, more curiosity, could you convert the asset to euro by pulling the current exchange rate? Absolutely, you could. So the question would be, where have you got a good way to pull it? Um, there are packages that get, I believe there's a package for currency exchange rates, um, but you have to do an API call for that. So um, yeah, you could make it pull like the current exchange rate, but you have to use a package that can get that. Um, so I'd have to look that up, um, but I'm sure there's like a currency exchange rate package. Uh, oh yeah, I mean, it's absolutely doable, um, yeah. Where there's a will, there's a way. There's always a way to do it. It's just a matter of how unpleasant it's going to be. That one should actually be pretty easy. Like it's probably, you could probably do it with like a one line of code or something if you have the right package. Easiest way to do this instead of like this, the uh, numbers and stuff like that would really just be to rescale it, um, divide it by a thousand. Now, just interpret it in terms of in thousands of dollars. Super easy. And anything else? Hmm. I'm having a little bit of trouble getting the mutate command to add a column to the Gapminder data set and have it be permanent. Oh. Um, like it seems to work within that function, but if I sort of, you know, add a new line and just use the mutate command and, and then glimpse the data set, it doesn't seem to stick. 
Yeah, well, this is the thing. So if you do, uh, so here I'm pulling this code that you just put in the chat really quick and I'll, I'll fix that in a second. But um, okay, anyway, so yeah, the thing is, is if you go like gapminder, mutate variable equals new, and I display it, you'll see this new variable over here. But if I show gapminder again, right, you ain't got nothing. Right. Well, the reason for this is the way R works is no matter what you create like this with mutate, it doesn't change the original object. What's actually happening is you're taking these data, adding something new to it, and then I'm just printing it to the console, and then it's just gone forever. If you wanted to change the gap minder okay. data to add it, you'd have to overwrite the original gap minder with your modified version. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So I could do that. And then look at Gapminder, and now it's got the new variable added to it. Yeah. Okay, that's helpful. So, like a state equivalent would be, you know, it's like you're sort of collapsing your data set into something, and then it's automatically refreshing it to its base state. So that. So the the thing with this is sort of a a difference. Um, in some other languages and things, if you make any sort of a like a live like modification, it, it's called modifying in place. Um, but in R, things do not ever modify in place. You have to explicitly destroy the object and replace it with a new thing to make a change. Um, so R is quite specific. You have to be explicit that you want to um, either overwrite something as I'm doing here or create a new object. Um, yeah. It's okay. a little bit Thank you. Okay. This uh, next one. So is this code? Uh, mapping should be created by AES. Oh, well, the issue here is that you have Gapminder right here. You're, you've taken a data set, piped the data set in, but then provided it again, and it thinks that this thing right here is supposed to be an aesthetic call. If you delete that gapminder comma, it will work. Because essentially what you did um, without realizing it is you basically wrote code that looked like um, basically like that. Because um, what a pipe the pipe does is it takes it runs this thing and then takes this thing and puts it as the first argument of the next thing. So I can rewrite the statement up here instead of pipes to be like mutate get minder that. Um, and so essentially, you could imagine what what was done by accident was putting this big ugly mess of things together. And the issue was just that there's this extra get minder call here. If I remove that. And now works just fine. The pipes are a way to avoid nesting things like this is hard to read. So I just piped it instead. Which might be confusing, and that's okay. I think it's a little easier to read left to right and go uh, kind of like whoop, gamp minder. There we go. Hopefully that's not in the additional confusion. No, that's perfect. Okay. It's a lot to take in sometimes. Oh, it is. It's just a deluge. <laughs> crap. Um, and that's, you know, just sort of embrace it, like realize that things are always going to be continually confusing. Um, and it just sort of slowly but surely gets better. Um, I mean, it's essentially like, it really is like, sort of just being thrown somewhere to learn a new language. I mean, it's like the first yeah. time you drop into a class and you're learning like, you know, you learn like Russian or something like that. It's like, hey, I got no idea what's going on. We're taking baby steps. The difference is I'm like trying to, instead of teaching like fundamentals and stuff, I'm sort of like teaching you um, the basic stuff necessary to survive. I'm like telling you how to ask someone for food and find the bathroom. And so the, the reason that those sounds convert to that meaning isn't always gonna be clear until later but we're gonna start with the applied stuff and sort of build it continually as we go, which is actually kind of what it's like if you learn a language by just going to the country and immersing yourself, which as it turns out works pretty well, um, but it can be definitely terrifying during the process. So it's okay. Yeah, no, I've, I lived in Germany for three years, so uh, I know it's where I speak German as well. So now, but yeah, the first three months were- Oh yeah. Were, Terrifying for sure, especially yeah. as a missionary. So that was even more interesting. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the immersion works, though, and this is sort of a weird approach to 
immersion. It's kind of make you do things with things you don't quite understand. You build the intuition before you build the technical understanding of why it works. And then I come back with the technical explanations as we go. Right. Yeah. So, eh, we'll, we'll get there. No, oh, yeah. Everybody does. It just takes some time. No, thanks for your help. Of course. Sorry, I think I missed something. Mm -hmm. uh, I wonder for the next, uh, like uh, the line 22, uh, what did you do to change the X, uh, like from 1,000 to 100, change the unit from 1,000 to 100? So on which line? Uh, line 22. 22? Oh, sorry, 23, I think, from ah. 23. Yeah. Okay, so here, um, all I've done here, are you asking what I'm doing here or? Oh, I mean, uh, the X, uh, Excel, like uh, it's changed from 1000 to 100, I think. Changed from 1000 to 100. Uh, no, not the code, but the picture we get, the plot, the palette we get. Oh, are are you saying like these things are? Yes. Like yeah, now we have we have one ten one hundred, but before this part, I think we are like one hundred to one thousand. Yeah, so all I did, it was because I've actually, I'm using a different variable. So I changed oh. GDP per capita to GDP per capita divided by a thousand. Um, and so if I instead use GDP per cap, the original variable, you'd get that, which is up to, you know, scientific notation. Um, yeah, I just divided it by, oops, I just divided it by a thousand. And so um, it makes it a little bit easier to display. You'd have to interpret it as, a thousand dollars, ten thousand, and a hundred thousand. Um, but that's one way to sort of rescale it to make it a little bit easier uh, to read. Thank you. That's helpful. Yeah. So I'm going to grab something. Somebody Slack channeled something. So I'm going to uh, check out what they got here. Europe not found. So I'm going to assume. It's kind of ugly, but we'll start with that. So they want to do that, and then they asked, uh, oh, they asked how to get rid of, again, the scientific notation. So the example I will give to them is, um, actually, I'll just say, why don't they, Up in hundred thousands, maybe. There we go. How about popping millions? There we go. I will give them that. Now, if I didn't want to do that, I could instead say, uh, fill uh, continuous. Uh, folks got any other questions? Oh, here we go. Sorry. 
what's a good way to visually connect lines between gaps in data such as this? Let me take your code and see what it looks like. Oh, yeah. Probably want uh, send in and lowercase country. Uh, yeah, I renamed my variables with capital. Sorry about that. Ah, uh, that's just fine. Uh, it didn't necessarily work for me. Okay, so you're asking good way to visually connect lines between gaps. So which gaps? Oh, let me, um, huh. Let me try something on mine. Oh, I know what you did. You had, I see how I changed this to from equals equals to percent in. Yes. That's well, watch what happens. If I do <laughs> that that explains. explains. So the, the thing is, is, e is equals equals is not getting things that equal either Rwanda or Cambodia. It's actually testing each line sequentially to be if does line one equal Rwanda, line two equal Cambodia, line three equal Rwanda, line four equal Cambodia. It's a weird thing called vector recycling I'm going to introduce in week four, but just know that you want to use percent in if you want to select from amidst uh, a group of things. Thank you. Okay. Ah, uh, here's a great question, chat. Why is it scales colon colon comma? What's the function of colon colon and why comma? This is an odd thing. So what this is actually saying is um, this is a way for me to use something from the scales package without loading the scales library. I could instead say, instead of that, I could go library scales like that and then run it and get the same result. Um, this comma is a function from the scales library. Um, I can call it without any parentheses because the function sort of operates in the background of scale y continuous to convert its values for me. Um, I just did it like uh, this because normally you don't have to load the entire scales package. You just grab one function out of it at a time, but it's actually the same thing as uh, uh, let's see, control y. Control Y, redo, Control Y. Okay, now I'm saying Control T. Um, yeah, this is just a way to skip loading that package. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit more in uh, some other examples in class. Sometimes there's good reasons to do that. Um, if you don't want to load some package because it overwrites some functions you're using, you might just call on a single function out of it using colons. You could go your entire life without ever doing it that way if you didn't want to, but it's something I just use often with the scales package because I usually only ever use one function out of it. Yeah, and comma is just a function. If I like to control uh, enter on this, it's just a function. I can do question mark on it, and it has documentation over here on the, the comma function is... Uh, right here, you can just tell it how to how to build things. Normally, you wouldn't give it any arguments or anything, though. Um, yeah, it's okay if that doesn't make much sense. It's sort of a weird thing that I'm calling on a function from another package without giving any arguments. Um, it's kind of a thing to just do to know that you've seen that before when you need to do it, because the technical reason for the way it works is. Uh, Awfully complicated. R is deep. It is incredibly deep. Um, it's it's kind of a very challenging thing. And so you know you're constantly going to encounter things. You're like, oh, this is weird. I don't, I don't understand what's going on. And it's okay. Don't expect to. And and you know, you, you learn the things that you need to get by. And as you need to learn new things, you'll pick that stuff up. And you know, it comes to you slowly. If you try and understand everything all the way through all the time, you're just going to constantly be having to chase stuff down. Um, it's like, I don't understand everything that's going on in, in, in here or anything at all. And every time I dig into something, I find something else. I don't understand how the hell it works. And that's perfectly fine. So you don't know enough to use it. Okay, well, that's 522. Um, so yeah, no, absolutely. And if you have any other questions, uh, hit um, Slack channel, uh, email, all that kind of stuff. I'll get to them. Okay.
拜。